Okay. We're gonna go ahead and, and start. Uh, let me, let me, uh, can everybody hear me? Can you, I have everybody on mute, but if you can, uh, if you can uh, put your hand up for a second on the link, that way I know everybody can hear me and we'll get started. Awesome, okay. We'll go ahead and get started. So appreciate everybody's time. We wanted to kind of do something a little bit different due, the, due to the pandemic, we can't get together unfortunately, so I appreciate everybody taking the time to join us and uh, wanted to welcome everybody this afternoon. And um, we ha hopefully you have the four suggested food items that we asked you to get together, the thinly prosciutto, the baguette, the 24 to 36 month Parmigiano Reggiano, and the salted pistachios. On behalf of my wife, Gisela, <laughs> and the rest of the team, uh, Robert, Lauren, uh, Tad, Erica, Maria, Karina, we wanted to thank you all for the privilege of allowing us to serve you and your family. We know it's a big responsibility to help you with your investments, and we, don't, we would not take that responsibility lightly. So thank you so much. And we're ready to try some amazing wines. I hope you have yours ready as, as well as, as I do right here next to me. And I'm very excited to introduce our speakers, which I'll do right now. So we have two speakers joining us. The first one is David Lynch, who's the editorial director for Psalm Select. Uh, David, over his long career in the wine business, has been has seen it from just about every angle as a business magazine writer, editor at Wine and Spirits, GQ, and Bon Appetit, bon Appetit as a small Yang acclaimed restaurants, Babo in New York City. I think I'm pronouncing that right and Quincy in San Francisco as an award-winning <laughs> author of two books on Italian wine, Vino Italiano, and now as editorial director for the famed online retailer, Psalm Select. Through his career, David has won James Beard Awards in two separate fields, journalism and wine service and restaurants. And actually I got a few more people in the waiting room. Let me let them in and I'll continue I just let them in. And the second person I want to introduce is uh, Master Sommelier Ian Cobble, co-founder of Psalm Select. Uh, on a side note, happens to be my college roommate of three years and a uh, great, great guy and a tennis friend that uh, we play tennis together on the team. So Ian Cobble is one of only 274 Master Sommeliers on the planet who have passed a notoriously difficult exam since 1969. After graduating with a degree in international business, wine business, uh, and Spanish at Sonoma State University in 2003, Ian worked at Harvest, at a Harvest in Portugal, which subsequently launched his wine career. In 2011, Ian won the best young sommelier in the world competition in Athens, and that same year took first place at Top Psalm in the United States. He has since then been featured in the cult classic wine documentary Psalm, S-O-M-M, -M, in 2012, which chronicled his quest to become a master sommelier. Today, you can, you can follow Ian's worldwide hunt for exceptional wines at psalmselect.com, a free subscription that caters to both knowledgeable and wine enthusiasts and a casual wine drinkers wishing to expand our palate and our cellar. So with that, in a moment, I'm gonna share their screen. On a side note, uh, because I work for Raymond James, a big bank firm, we are highly, highly regulated, which means that we can't have the comment section here and, and you can't ask questions. However, our, our workaround for that is gonna be if you want to email uh, Connor, who works with him at Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R, at SOM Select, S-O-M-M, S E L E C T dot com. That's Connor at psalmselect.com. If you have any questions during this next hour, uh, they'll do their best depending on how many we get. I know we have quite a few people on a Zoom, but they said they'll promise to do their best. So I'm going to let a few more people in and I will hand it over to David and to Ian. Right on. Can you all hear us? Wait till the screen comes. I can, but they're on mute, but give me one second. I'm going to put you, I'm going to pin you. Sorry, Ian, I was letting people in. No problem. Uh, 
Oops. Can you guys all see us? All right. Right Maybe on. Go to, yeah, all right. And then if the chat feature is activated, then we can kind of answer questions in real time if people want to shoot that in. Or is that coming questions to are you? coming through the email. Great. I'm coming through the email. Yeah. Okay. Because there's no chat feature? Yeah. Yeah, there's no chat feature. Um, I'm, for starting to think that, I'm starting to think that best in state thing might be a little bit uh, <laughs> premature there, Glenn. It's for managing money, not <laughs> technology. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. Boy. I love it. Get, give Glenn some <laughs> that's, crap. That's I love fine. It. That's fine. No chat feature. <laughs> That's fine. We'll, we're, we're gonna, I'm used to the chat feature. We're going to have a feature. great time. Anyway. We so, like the chat feature. Next time we like we'll pay the, the extra $5.99. Yeah. All right. So anyway. All right. So, um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I can't you, – Connor, can you put it on gallery? I want to see all these beautiful faces in the, in the crowd here. It's always fun to – Oh, wow. Oh, now, look now at everybody. Talking. All right. Hello, wow. everybody. I love it. What a good-looking crowd. Right on. What's up, everyone? Uh, so, uh, my name's David. This is Ian. We are uh, the uh, – uh, the brains and the brawn behind uh, Sam Select. He's, of course, the brains. I'm the brawn uh, behind uh, <laughs> SamSelect.com. Some of you may know of us already. Some of you may even be customers. But uh, either way, uh, our young uh, associate Connor sent you some delicious wines. And we went with an Italian theme tonight. That's interesting. Very close to my own heart. Something I've been fo uh, following for years and years and years uh, and spending a lot of time in Italy uh, before all this COVID stuff happened. So we have uh, both a white and a red. And I think, I guess the best way to describe this theme would be, it's not just Italy, but it's like extremes of Italy. Yes. Right. I, I mean, you're agree. talking about two polar ends of the Italian boot. The white is from Sicily, from a little satellite island of Sicily. The red is from Piedmont, almost in the Alps, way, way up in the northwest of Italy. So we have, I think, two great wines to talk about something that we talk about all the time, which is terroir, right? 100%. A very important word for any aspiring wine geek is terroir. Uh, the closer to French you want to pronounce it, it always takes that little extra bit of courage to really go for it in the French pronunciation. And make sure you sound very pretentious when you say it. Don't yeah. say like terroir, like a yeah. normal American would. Yeah, you say like terroir. terroir. Like make people terroir. feel very intimidated you gotta like that you have that, lots of wine knowledge. You gotta like roll that R in your throat a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> terroir. terroir. Yeah, eat some cheese before, get yeah. it going, you know? Yeah. So um, Ian and Glenn were college roommates. That's interesting. We, we're yeah. not gonna go in. There's no stories. I'm not telling yeah, you any stories going, about Glenn today. Right, Maybe like three actually at the end. Let's wait till we get a little bit easy take. easy i'm just kidding so perhaps by show of hands i would just be interested to see like how many folks would consider themselves wine enthusiasts interested in wine or are, are most of the crowd let's say i'm serious about wine right okay thumbs up all right so we've got and then how many people would describe themselves more as wine novices like i really don't drink very much wine okay all right so we have because uh, we always like to you know kind of gauge the gauge the room. So yeah, speak, exactly. Right? So um, what we're going to do, I guess, is, is talk a little bit about where these wines come from, what grapes they're made from, and so forth, but also about the sort of practice of tasting and appreciating wine. Um, yes. I think that's really important, right? Because not only is it, um, I think, a fun exercise, I mean, something about wine in comparison to all of the other beverages is that it's not constant, right? A beer, a certain kind of beer, an IPA made by this brewery is always going to be the same. A whiskey made by this distillery is always going to be the same. Wine is ever changing, ever evolving, not only in terms of from producer to producer, but from year to year. And so the, pro the process of tasting wine is not only uh, enlightening and fun, and, and, and it, but it also kind of will hopefully give you some uh, snob bona fides to take out into the world and, and, and sort of start to project a, a, a sort of a classier image uh, out there in the world. So let's talk to the master taster himself and get a few techniques, some tips. How do you do this? What do you do? Yeah. What's the process? You know, first and foremost, let's figure out how to, how to hold the glass. Where do we hold the glass? We hold the glass by the stem. If you can think about why, there's one major reason. You don't really want to transfer the heat from your hand into the glass. Everyone knows your body's around 98 degrees. This wine's around 50 degrees. If you hold it by the stem, you're not only going to get the olive oil and the guacamole off, off of your hands from your appetizers, right? Your, your glass is going to look like you've been on a road trip for 10 years. You know, you, you always got that person and you're like, you can't even see that the wine is white or red through their, through their guacamole stain that's a quarter inch thick, right? So let's first and foremost, you can hold it 
like this, if you want to be a normal person, if you really want to be pretentious and intimidate people and really make them like really be afraid of talking to you about wine, you can hold it by the base like this. Okay. If you hold it like this, you can, you just can't come over to my house and drink with me, but that's fine. Yeah. If you just hold kidding. it like this, I'm just teasing. I mean, granted, there might be some stemless glass users out there. No, no judgments. That's fine. But if the glass has a stem and you're holding it like this, you're sort of advertising yourself as a hack and we really can't have that. So let's, um, okay, everyone's with me. I'm seeing if some people are like, well, what the hell is that guy talking about? I hold this glass like this all the time. What's wrong with that? Um, so anyway, let's you know, talk about- really, really, and I will finish with this. You do whatever you're happy with, you know? And if you wanna sit at home and you wanna watch whatever you watch and hold it by the, by the bulb, just don't tell me. That's all, that's all right, I ask you. Right, right. And the pour, you know, I mean, obviously we have what's called the, the country club pour, which is where they take it all the way up Close you know, to the fill rim. it up to here, honey. You know, you, you know, always have that people you're working the, in the restaurant. That's the Friday night lights pour. And they, right and they there, want right? the 13 ounce pour, even though they're actually charging you for five ounces. So the, the country club pour is literally yeah. up to the top. Yeah. All right. But what that en enables you, what, what that prevents you from doing is swirling, which is a critical function of wine tasting. So the swirl, let's talk swirl. Yeah. So first of all, you know, hold the glass by the stem and imagine that there's a quarter underneath your glass. Put the glass down and go towards your heart. If you're right-handed, go towards your heart. Left-handed, go towards your heart. You start on right? the table. And you're trying to put the center of a laser beam that's going directly from the stem of your glass, going around a half dollar or a circle. Okay, once you're swirling, that's great. Why do we swirl? Basically to volatize the aromas from liquid into gas. Same thing if you have a cold stick of butter and as it warms up, the aroma volatizes and will fill the room once it gets warm. Same thing that happens with a cold glass of wine. The aromas are muted as it warms up. The aromas go from liquid into gas. Why is that important? Because your olfactory bulb on the back of your nose where you get all of these, this information, let's go ahead and put your nose in the glass and you smell 20 different things immediately. All of these, these aromatic compounds register in your olfactory bulb, send messages to your brain and that's how we basically taste. On your palate, you have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and then umami like soy sauce and mushroom. Um, and then other than that, all of the taste, when you taste something, the molecules hit the back of your nose and you're actually majority of what you taste is the back of your nose. So that's important. So let's go ahead and tilt the glass away from yourself. You can see this wine has a concentrated yellow core, really, really in concentrated. Let's talk core. What do you mean by core? The core is the center of the glass, just like the core of an apple. If you were to cut open an apple, you would have the core in the center and then you would have the rim and then the meniscus. The meniscus is really right on the edge. If you literally, if you look at it on a white background, you'll see a little bit of water um, looking thing. And that's actually the alcohol that's kind of kicking on the outside. Um, go ahead so and swirl what, the glass. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, you know, master tasters do is would, they would put this wine against a white background because sight, you know, you're engaging all your senses when you're tasting a wine. Now, obviously you might not have a white piece of paper hand handy, but sight is, uh, oh, there's a, that's a question or is that no, from before? I was, okay. I was just gonna... So you're trying to make some, there's a lot of judgments you can make about a wine based on sight. Um, white wines will gain color as they age. They're going to go in the same way that like you cut an apple in half and you put it on the counter, it's going to turn brown over time. That happens to white wines over time. They go from that sort of straw yellow gold to a deeper gold to an almost like amber. And then when it's over, they're brown. Uh, with a red wine, they lose color as they age. So um, they'll start maybe in that more sort of purple, ruby, kind of vibrant, uh, saturated color and get both lighter in color, as well as like more brickish, more orange, more brown, eventually. Eventually going to brown, yeah. exactly. So then from there, there's a lot of, um, oh, what's that? Okay. Map of Sicily. Oh, wow. All right. Um, so what you have um, in this first white is a wine from Sicily, more specifically the little archipelago of islands off the Northeast coast. It's called the um, Aeolian Islands. So that's Lipari, Stromboli, uh, and uh, the island from which this wine hails, which is called Salina. So those are those little sort of- On the top right corner of, of Sicily, Sicily, you yeah, see that kind of islands. top right, there's about six or seven islands that are all volcanic. You get can, there by- Can everybody see the map? I don't know. Can everybody see the map? How do we know that? Who, who put that up there, Glenn? Glenn did. Okay. Um, so yeah, there you go. So hopefully everyone can see that. And- um, so one, of the, I don't know that you'd be able to, from sight, tell that this wine is from Sicily no. uh, or from the island of Salina. However, um, you might, once you put your nose in the glass, 
tell that it's from this. Yeah, you know, place. first and foremost, let me talk a little bit about the legs. Uh, Glenn, we can go back to that map in a minute, um, but let's first talk about this wine. So if everyone kind of swirls the glass, right, everyone sees the legs. Everybody loves to brag about the legs. Everyone's like, oh my God, look at the legs on this thing. What do the legs actually mean? So the legs on the wine really mean if they're really thick and really slow moving, that means it has high alcohol. If they're thin and fast moving, it means it has low alcohol. If it has low alcohol, but it goes, still goes move, move slow, that means it has high sugar. Like for example, a late harvest German Riesling, a Buren Auslese, for example, can have 6% alcohol, but have uh, 200 grams per liter of sugar, which is like uh, three times the sugar content of a Coca-Cola, for example. And those are gonna go very slowly. So in the majority of times, if you're drinking a Cabernet at a steakhouse, and the legs are slow, that means it has high alcohol, usually around 15%. If they go fast, that usually means the red has about an 115 to 12% alcohol um, as, as, a, as a rule. Yeah, I mean, I, the, other, the other thing I'd say about sight is that there are some conclusions you could draw. If you were involved in blind tasting, which is a key component of the master sommelier exam, where you're literally poured six glasses of wine, three whites, three reds, they don't tell you anything about them, and you're supposed to identify them, where they come from, what grape variety, uh, uh, what vintage, so forth. So there are some things that you can tell, not only about the age of the wine, uh, but also about which grape variety. Certain grape varieties are more pigmented than others. So there might be some things that you would, for example, in looking at this red, there are several grape varieties that both of us would rule out immediately as not being that great. Or for uh, this wine, per, for example, there's grapes that you would rule out this not being. I mean, Pinot Grigio is usually more of a copper issue. Mm -hmm. This wine has almost like a greenish yellow hue on the on the meniscus. So let's move off from sight. Um, let's go into smell. Yeah. So you put your nose in the glass. You're going to break things down into a number of things. Fruits, flowers, herbs, earth, and wood. There's five things. If you're describing wine, you typically start with fruits. Here, what am I getting out of the gate? I'm getting almost like a, like a green tropical fruit rind almost like a green papaya skin, not quite, you know, really ripe papaya candy or papaya flesh. This is like, like rind. There's a little bitterness, almost melon skin. There's a little bit of salty lemon going on. Salty lemon. Yep. And uh, it's got a very greenish um, tone to it. Green mango comes to mind. There's a little bit of almost like a lime pith or like a, li a lemon verbena herbaceous tone. Um, do that. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> or if you do great. You know, once well, once you say it too, then everyone's like, "Oh yeah, I get the mango skin, of course." Yeah, <laughs> I, I love get, it. Getting some great mango so, skin on that. So, and and it's important too to not, uh, not be general. Don't just say mango. You should say mango skin or mango flesh. There's a difference, right? Yeah. So be specific. If it's an apple, what kind of apple? Is it a red apple? Is it a green apple? Is it a yellow apple? Um, Oxidized? Is, is it, it apple pie? Guy? Yeah. So we it. we go into some. Uh, Kelly is Kelly Davenport needs to be admitted here. Let's, I mean, I'm just hitting admit. I don't know what it means, but who knows who they are. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit. I, I, I keep admitting her. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but I've admitted uh, okay. everybody else. I'm on it. No worries. While well, we're trying to assist. Let's talk a little bit about <laughs> where this is from. And we've both been to this place. This it's is like one of the most iconic places I've ever been. So this is, um, and the, I don't, it's the, the way you have the pictures ordered. This is the one that has all the whitewashed buildings on it, the island. It's called Salina. I don't know if, show that. I don't know if anyone um, has been to any of the Aeolian Islands, but you take a hydrofoil there um, from uh, either Messina or a town called um, what the hell? Tarmina? No, not, not Tarmina. No, it's it's on the northeast coast off Sicily, and so these are all little volcanic mounds in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they grow in addition to grapes. They grow a lot of capers on Salina. Selena was also the setting of the movie Il Postino, which some of you may remember from way back when. Very classic uh, film. It was actually the first date. Yeah, that's it right there. So there's Selena, spectacular place. You see one of the ferries pulling in with some uh, tourists or, or whoever. And these uh, islands are this incredible uh, terroir, if you will, for uh, wine, both red and white. The soils are very volcanic. Uh, one of the interesting things about volcanic soils is that they they never were uh, sandy soils in general and volcanic soils were very uh, resistant to phylloxera. Phylloxera was a, is a vine pest that decimated the, the, the vineyards of Europe in the late 19th century. Um, and uh, in so doing, 
the, pretty much the entirety of Europe, except for a few pockets, had to replant all their vineyards on American rootstocks uh, to be resistant to phylloxera. Phylloxera ended up coming to the US eventually as well, but it was a really devastating thing uh, in Europe at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. And this was one of the areas of the world that was spared from that. And that's useful mostly from a heritage standpoint. It's not necessarily translates to a qualitative thing, but it is interesting. And uh, the grape variety here, as we said, is Malvasia. So it's a very aromatic variety grown in these, literally on the side of a volcanic crater. In fact, this, this illustration is meant to be an illustration of the vineyard that kind of crawls up the side of this volcanic crater in these very dark, almost black soils, yep. surrounded by wild Mediterranean herbs. And these, these people grow probably as many capers as they do. This guy is the caper king yeah, of he's Selena. The caper king like, of you Selena. know, the sausage king of Chicago, like yeah. in Ferris Bueller's. Yeah. This guy's the, the caper king of Selena. So I went and hung out with this guy. And uh, I was I had like one of the best three days of my life. But he gave me a bag of capers that I just ran out of. And I was there two and a half years ago. But um, that's inter interesting. This is a single vineyard called Infatata. So you're literally in the town on the north side of the island, you go walk down to these cliffs and you're basically about 20 feet away from this 60 foot drop off into the waves crashing on this rock. You can smell, when you're standing in the vineyard, you can smell the ocean. You can smell the, the tide, you can smell the wet rocks and the mussels. And you're, that's where the vineyard is. Infatat is a single vineyard, literally on a cliff. So I invite everybody, let's take a sip of this wine. Don't finally, just, what's been like a half an hour? You can finally drink. Don't just, don't just. You've take all a been sip. waiting, right? You, you waited until now to sip it. I hope. <laughs> no, they've been. That drinking. was the rule. I, uh, they were, they were pre-gaming with gin okay. tonics. Oh, okay, they're right, fine. Right, they're, right. they're okay. So, uh, let, let's go ahead and take a sip. I don't want you just to take a sip and swallow it. Okay, like if you walk by the Mona Lisa and just look at the Mona Lisa and keep walking, it's different than looking at a piece of art. Look at this. It's like a piece of art. Take a sip and chew the wine slowly for about five or six seconds. Breathe a little bit of air into your mouth. Try to bring those molecules so the olfactory bulb. Try not to choke, right? I've seen people do it before. I've done it myself. So like this. A little slurping. Bring in some air. It's okay. You can't do it with your soup, but you can do it with your wine. Slurping is okay. Chew it. Expose it on the, under your gums. You'll feel it's almost a little bit bitter. That's called phenolic bitterness. Very typical for a lot of grapes. Malvasia, a lot of different Italian wines. And that phenolic bitterness is a clue to where this wine comes from. Everybody can taste not as much tropical fruits on the palate. It's, it's a little bit more citrusy and salty, but that salinity really comes through. And I'll tell you what, that's exactly what I want to reach for is something like this. You know, I want some salty pr uh, preserved meat. I want a piece of fresh wild fish with capers and a little squeeze of lemon. I want linguine alla frutta di mare. I want something fresh. I don't want steak with this wine. This would actually be very good with like chicken piccata, for example. You have all those capers and lemon and chicken. If So, you know, depending on if you're roasting a chicken and putting barbecue sauce on it, it goes in a different way. If you roast a chicken and put capers and lemon on it, the pairing goes into a different uh, direction. So invite everyone to have some nuts and some prosciutto. I want to talk a little bit about oak or lack thereof in this case. <clears throat> so everyone can smell smell this wine. It, it doesn't smell like the two by four section of Home Depot, right? So that's a sign. That's a sign of oak. Oak, oak smells like vanilla, uh, different baking spices like nutmeg, um, coconut extract. Um, what other markers? Vanilla. Yeah. Toast. Exactly. Toast. Toast. Bread. Yeah. Buttered bur bread. Bur literally burnt wood. Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of wine that I prefer, I don't want to smell new wood. Wood, it should be like pepper on a steak. It shouldn't dominate the flavor. It should be an accent. And I think there's a big problem with too much, too many people putting too much oak on wine. And it's like, it's like too much makeup. I, you know, don't put new, new makeup on a, on a, on a baby, right? It doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. So I think a great wine like this, this is wine spends six months in stainless steel barrel, maybe nine. I think the Empatata might spend 12 months in stainless steel, mm -hmm. but this wine is protected from oxygen because oxygen is going to break down those really delicate aromatic and uh, all those, um, terpenes, the terpenes that really smell, like when you smell the, the peel of a fresh Meyer lemon, or if you smell a fresh fruit, those are the terpenes really creating those aromatics. And when you have a fresh aromatic white wine that goes into barrel, oxygen will break those things down, making them smell like they're a, you know, two day old like, cut yeah, piece like of fruit versus a fresh out. piece of fruit. Yeah. Um, other than that, oak can be very beneficial to certain wines, but not aromatic, fresh, salty wines like this. Right. I thought it might be 
um, useful to uh, kind of decode the label here. It's something that uh, is always important for American wine drinkers drinking European wines because the European model, and we'll see it more with the red than the white, the European model typically does not, often does not mention the grape variety used at all, uh, unless let's say the importer decides to put it on the back label. This one actually does. So if you have the Infatata bottle with you, hold it to you and we'll go right down the line here. So of course at the top is Caravaggio. Antonino Caravaggio is the producer, okay? Infatata, which means enchanted in Italian is simply like a little name, like a little, what they call, the Italians call it a nome di fantasia, a, 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 just a, a, a brand name for the wine. He calls it Infatata. In this case, it also happens to be the name of that vineyard that it hails from. And you see that a lot on European and American wines. The vineyard site is often called out in some way to show that this vineyard is special and it produces a special kind of wine. Oftentimes when you're reading a restaurant wine list, that vineyard designation is often put in quotes. It'll say like, you know, domain de so-and-so, such and such premier cru, in quotes, that quote is often a vineyard designation. In other words, it came from that vineyard right there. Uh, then you have Malvasia Seca. So in this case, they did put the grape variety on the bottle. You don't always see that. And then you have Salina 2019. So Salina is where it's from, right? That's the island and the vintage. Now, if you flip it around, there's often a lot of very useful information here. So you see in Fatara, you see Malvasia, you see Salina. So right under Salina in smaller type is something called Indicazione Geografica Protetta, which I don't think you need to be an Italian scholar to see that that's an indication of, it means protected geographic origin. So that's really the sort of the, the organizing principle around all wine labeling is that it has a geographic marker, right? Connor Howard, Connor at psalmselect.com. Yeah, so, I wanted to, so I'm getting texts from some people asking okay. me who to uh, email with questions. Again, it's Connor, C-O-N-N-O-R at psalmselect.com at S-O-M-M-S-E-L-E-C-T.com. What we're going to see, we're going to see a different kind of geographic indication on the next bottle, but this one, whenever there is a, whenever the sort of official appellation that the wine comes from is an official appellation, that, that little smaller type is going to be right under it. So if you looked at this bottle, you didn't know anything about it, it'd be tough, right? Because you're like, where the hell is Selena? What's Bianco Secco mean? Uh, oh, okay, it's bottled by this place in Malfa, Isola di, di Salina. So maybe if you are a well-traveled individual, you might know where Salina is, or maybe you saw Il Postino and you remember that uh, that was Salina. Um, but that's the, the, the geographic indication is a very big part of all wine labeling, including ours. The difference is that Americans will place, American producers will typically place a greater emphasis on the grape name and a lesser emphasis on the place name, usually. Um, so I hope that's indicative. So it's Infatata. You just have to know, you, you don't know what the hell that means. Malvasia is the grape. Salina is where it comes from. Bianco Seco means dry white, photo to Glenn? right? That's the really so that's, our, that's the decoding that we can do there. But I can see how it would be extremely intimidating. Like you walk up and look at this front label. What does it really tell you? I mean, I kind of feel like the illustration sort of evocative of the kind of wine it's going to be like kind of fresh and lively and kind of herbaceous, but Really? I don't know. I mean, it kind of looks like a kid's drawing of a Christmas tree it with like a dead whale me of underneath a Christmas it, but, tree. Uh, yeah. but uh, anyway, that, that's, that's part of the challenge of getting into wine is decoding these labels and trying to figure out what the hell they mean. And we'll get into it with the uh, red as well, which will also give us some great stuff to work with in the sort of European labeling universe. You know, and what I used to do when I was learning about wine is I would buy a bottle of wine, you know, say it was $15 a bottle, I'd buy something I had no idea uh, where it was from or anything and I would bring it home and I would look at where it was bottled and I would look it up on a map and I would sometimes look at Google images and you kind of transport yourself there most of us you know probably in the call a lot of us like to drink Napa a lot of us like to drink Sonoma but when you start to go outside your comfort zone you need to learn about these things to really uh, find you know comfort in, in learning about these and wanting to try them again so you can go look at these beautiful photos you kind of transport yourself through the glass taste it you know drink it hopefully you're enjoying the flavors of it and one thing I would say that's important about this wine is it this is a food wine. It does it does drink well on its own, but I think most of you will find that once you get a little Marcona almond, 
maybe some Parmesan, a little bit of salt and cured meat, the wine completely changes. Any of that bitterness that you might be getting that most of you, some of you, when you actually tasted the wine when at first, like, oh, this is not my style because you're used to drinking maybe an Oki California Chardonnay or a Sancerre or Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. These wines really start to make sense when you have the right thing on the, t on the table, whether that be some freshly grilled calamari or a freshly grilled fish with a little bit of lemon. Um, a lot of these things, the fat binds to, to the tannin, which is a little bit of tannin on this. That's that bitterness you're getting. It's coming from the skin and that will soften it out, creating this you know, orchestra versus a, a flute. Um, on its own, for example. And that's what you want with food and wine pairings is you want everything to play off of each other, creating a harmonious experience to enjoy your life. All right, so we have one question here. Uh, Julie was oh, wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> aging wine, uh, mentioning that a lot of documentaries mentioned that uh, you know the US population typically buys and drinks without aging. Uh, and she was curious. The is, world is population a, typically buys and drinks without, right. without aging. Uh, was curious also just to, if there's a good way to know what wines do you age, what wines do you not age? It's a good question. Great way to talk about some select. Yeah, it's a, you know, the, it, there are, this wine is not designed to be aged, I no. don't think. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that um, a lot of aging and sort of the, the ability of wines to age has to do with the storage conditions. If this wine were left in a dark corner of the cellar in which it was made, where it's nice and cool, and it's just sitting there unmoved, unmolested, it probably could age for 10 years. I would agree. I would think you could have this thing 10 to 15 years and it would be good. I think this wine's probably at its best on release and over the next two years. And if you're gonna age it, make sure you're doing so in a dark environment at 55 degrees, humidity over 70%. Um, this wine did have a cork. If you if you aged it in a warm closet in your guest house out back without you know air conditioning, the heat will break down the aromatics and you'll end up with something that smells flat and that doesn't have the energy and the intensity that you're really looking for. You know this is this is a really really special bottle of wine, especially price to quality wise. Um, for me, this is one of my favorite wines of of Italy that we actually offer most of the time twice a year, um, and it's just an iconic wine that's coming from. I mean, this is a volcano that didn't exist 300 million years ago. And you have basically an eruption underneath the ocean that eventually there's enough magma that creates an island. And then the eruption stops. And all of a sudden you have birds that bring seeds that then the seeds germinate. Yeah, well, and they okay, create. Well, hold on a so long story short, and then here we are 300 million years forward and we're drinking a wine that was brought in mostly, most likely by the Phoenicians. And now we get to be on Zoom drinking it. It's kind of tangent crazy. alert. Tangent alert. <laughs> Tio. We we the question was how can you tell if a wine is capable of aging? You know what? That's a tough one. So I would. There it are takes couple, time. There are a couple of things. It takes time. There are a couple of things. One of the huge lifelines of a wine is its acidity level, um, and acidity. This wine has a goodly amount. Acidity is that effect of causing you to salivate. Tannin, another element of a wine structure, is another component that helps a wine age. A wine with abundant tannin is sort of built to last. It's for built reds. to it's for yeah. reds, and and reds literally extract uh, tannins from their skins. Uh, whites are typically fermented without any contact with their skins. They're pressed, and just the juice is fermented. Whereas Red wines usually begin fermentation in this big soup of skins and juice. Most of the juice of red, red wine grapes is actually clear. They get their color from steeping in their skins, much like tea steeps. Um, and so the longer you steep tea, for example, the more bitter it's gonna be with, with uh, red wines. Uh, you steep them in their, in their skins, they develop this tannic, Sometimes it can be a little harsh. Sometimes it can be a little, when the wines are young, they, they need time for some of those tannins to precipitate out so that the wine softens and kind of releases all the other things kind of beyond that cloak of tannin that they have. Right. So, so, that, so a, typically a, a wine, sorry, I mean, I, how, I think acidity is a huge component. You know, but how do you know when you're buying a bottle of wine, that's why you need to, use some, to trust your experts. You need to trust somebody at the store. How long should I age this for? If he tells you three to five years, take a pen when you get home and write three to five years. If you look at the Psalm Select offers that come into your inbox, we do two offers a day. One's less than $50, one's usually 50 to 150, and we tell you the age range. And you could print those out with the order and put them in your cellar with the wine. So that way you know, hey, I should drink this from 2025 to 2030. You know, that means, hey, put it away in a dark corner of your cellar and don't drink it. But 
it's a very difficult question. Um, and it takes a long time to develop that vocabulary of how long something should age. And you know what, Chianti Classico, for example, you have some producers that can age 35 to 50 years and they're gonna drink incredibly on their 50th birthday. You also have some that are completely manipulated. They have international winemakers from Australia leaving residual sugar and oak powder, and you really should never drink that wine. But if you are, you should probably drink it from zero to three years old. Um, so there's so many variables with every appellation of the world. And that's why people like us have jobs is because it's such a complex world and there's so much I'm still trying to learn. And I know David, we could say or call ourselves expert, but there's all sorts of moving pieces, including the climate, which is getting warmer in Burgundy, for example, and those wines from warm vintages now, that's never been so warm there. So those wines are drinking better from age five to nine, where they used to drink better from ages 15 to 30. So as the climate warms, uh, these the acidity drops and it's actually creating more juicy, more approachable wines in their youth, in particularly in France and different areas of Germany um, that have shown dr dramatic uh, heat spikes in the last seven years. Yeah, I mean, acidity is a huge component of the life of a, of a wine, the, the ability of a wine to age. If you think about tannin as like the backbone, acidity is the spinal cord, you know, and it's um, in terms of the way that a grape matures as sugar goes up, acidity goes down. So the sort of the riper, more approachable wine in its youth might not necessarily be as built for the long haul. For the most part, just to kind of put a, a sort of dot the eye on that question, I would say, you know, in terms of aging wine, the conditions are critical. If you don't have them, don't bother. You know what I mean? If you if you, if you don't have either like a little fridge or like who, those folks, look at that cellar, man. Todd Baird, nice, nice cellar, Todd. dude. Um, so if you don't have a Todd Baird cellar um, or a wealth manager like Glenn Smith who can get you a Todd Baird cellar, then I would say be like <laughs> or be like be like the rest of the ninety nine percent of the world who consume wines within a year of their release. It's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. For the most part, you're still going to get a lot out of it. And if you're willing to maybe like beat them up in a decanter a little bit, maybe there's like a young Barolo or something has a lot of tannin, give it some time in a decanter. You'd be surprised how uh, effective oxygen can be in loosening up a, a wine that's maybe a little bit tight and fierce when it's first. For born. whites and reds, a tight white. Sometimes if you have a really young white, a 2019, for example, if you have, were going to pour this for the first course of your dinner party and you, it's coming cold out of the fridge, you could put this into a canter, give it some air for 15 minutes, and it's going to show better than if you just poured it and people drank right away. So don't be afraid to decant young whites, young reds, and old reds you're decanting for a different reason, not for oxygen, but to remove them from se sediment. So as the wine ages, the tannin molecules and different things solidify out, and you'll end up with a little layer of what looks like fine sediment or dust, and you want to not, you don't want to pour that in your guest glass unless you're going to serve dental floss for dessert. Uh, so you actually want to make sure you decant old wine to, over 10 years old should technically be stored on its side and decanted carefully off of its sediment before serving. But vast majority of wines you're drinking probably won't have sediment. That segues uh, perfectly into our next question from uh, from David. Uh, how does serving temperature affect flavor? Does it vary more with red versus white? Dramatically. I mean, you want to start? It affects it really dramatically, and it's really uh, the, the, the sort of the standard wine geek refrain on this particular topic is that we serve our white wines too cold and our red wines too hot. In America, mostly. It, and so what does that mean? It means that we're serving white wines at refrigerator temperature, which can is, what, 36, 38, even 40 degrees, all of which is probably a little too cold to really... At that point, you sort of shut down the, the aromas in a way and flavors in a way that just think about how I mean, I'm trying to think cold about butter. It, yeah, cold butter versus warm butter is a great example. So, so typically let it come up to temperature. Like if you get served a bottle straight from the fridge in a restaurant, a white wine, have them leave it on the table. Don't put it on the ice. Just leave it on the table. But also have them bring an ice bucket in case because 20 minutes later, you're going to want to put it in the ice bucket. But for the first 20 minutes, it's like trying to have a conversation on a chairlift and it's 20 degrees, you know, and nobody wants to talk. That's the same thing the wine is like when it's coming out of the fridge. You can have some of the most brilliant wines in the world at 40 degrees and 60 degrees white wines. So 60 degrees, it's very, very cold. It's like the ocean in summer uh, off Sonoma coast here at 60 degrees, but that's still very cold. But the best white wines of the world should be served at 60 degrees. And the better a, wine, a white wine is, the warmer you want to serve it. But 60 degrees is not warm. 
because the molecules that you're paying good money for, you want to reach your nose, right? You don't want them to stay hidden in this liquid because 50% of the joy of, of wine is actually your nose. The aromas, the, the whole, the, the complexity of the aromas for me are 50% of the pleasure. So then you move over to the red side and why serve it cooler? Well, what's the other 50%, Ian? Uh, getting uh, intoxicated. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> it's, it's the taste. It's the taste, the experience of having the food and the wine and everything, you know, and also, you know, the, the heightened, uh, you know, euphoria after a bottle of wine is also a nice bonus, but other oh, than I that, well, it's also texture. I mean, acidity in wine is a fat cutter, you know? I mean, that's why it's great with the prosciutto, for example, the white, because it's in addition to sort of meeting up with some of the saltiness of the prosciutto, it's using that laser acidity to kind of cut through some of the fat, right? So like a Zamboni a little bit for your palate. Now, <laughs> Zamboni. Nice. So, Do you know what a Zamboni is? They know what a Zamboni oh, is. Come on. Uh, from the, if they're Texas, they might not know they what a Zamboni is. Tell them what a Zamboni I'm sure is. Dallas has a hockey team. They do. Uh, the stars. Or, yeah. So... So on the red side with temperature, it's a little bit, for me, a little bit more about texture. There are two things in red wines that um, are really exacerbated by excessive high temperature. Your typical room in your house is what, 70 degrees if it's comfortable? That's pretty hot for a wine. So as it get, and if you're in the kitchen and you're cooking and it's near the stove or the oven and suddenly it's up to 75, there are a lot of wines whose alcohol and and acidity and tannin will all be exacerbated by that higher temperature take that down to 65 and yeah. suddenly you've softened all those hard edges out and a whole another dimension of the wine uh comes out and it's the, the best way to do it is to literally do the experiment empirically start at room temperature with your wine stick it in the refrigerator for a half an hour and then retry it and I guarantee you, particularly with the sort of bigger, more serious reds, you'll enjoy it immensely more at 60, 65 than you will at 70, 75. Recommended temperature for red wine service is 55 degrees to 68. If you're drinking drinking a, a Beaujolais, for example, 55 to 60. If you're drinking a big Napa Cab, 65 to 68 port around 70 degrees. But if anybody's ever been to Hawaii, the water's 85 degrees, right? And it doesn't feel warm, right? So, but the sad part is a lot of people, they keep their, their reds on the countertop while they're boiling the pasta and you have your wine six inches away and you literally could be drinking 85 degree red wine by the time you don't even realize it. And you could, because you maybe been doing it for the last 20 years, so it doesn't seem off. But I think that the thing that'll change your life is if you do have a wine refrigerator and you start bringing wines out at 55 degrees and opening them and having them 30 minutes later, you're going to, you can never go back because you start to find, to taste these wines and experience these wines at the proper temperature and the aromatics and the, the clarity and the focus and the complexity and the alcohol is not dominating the delicate aromatics. And so I would recommend if you don't have a cellar, you can buy a little $20 laser gun and you can actually check the temperature of the wine. If it's sitting on your counter and it's 72 degrees on your thermostat, the wine's probably 72 degrees. You can put it into your freezer for eight minutes to 10 minutes to put on the timer. Don't forget about it or else the morning you'll find a frozen yeah. bottle of wine. But that's stuff. what I do. I don't have a big cellar. I have a couple wine fridges and then I have a big closet that's kind of underneath my stairs that the wine's about 70 degrees. If I'm having a dinner party, I throw it in the fridge or if I really need to chill it down quick, 10 minutes in, in the freezer and then I'll put it into a decanter and let it rest for 20 minutes. And it's at, at about a 65 degrees for reds. Before we move on to the red, which we need to do, right? Do you have a, do you have a, is there another uh, Just a, a real quick one. Uh, another David's wondering where we are and what we're looking at in the background. So oh. this is my backyard. <laughs> in Napa. Uh, yeah. In Napa. Uh, you can see my sauna behind me. That's, that's where I go to detoxify after I'm uh, drinking uh, delicious wines all night. And, uh, and I, I'm literally right at the base of Mount Veter in Southwest Napa, about three miles uh, west of downtown Napa Valley. It's almost time to get into the red. Why don't we go ahead and do that? So we, um, well, I did want to say one thing about, um, one last thing about temperature, and that is, if, let's say you have an open bottle of red that you haven't finished. Um, I don't really know what, like I've never really experienced that, but I know that it does happen to people. Um, if you have an open bottle of red wine, you know, that people talk about, you know, um, all these different preservation systems and stuff, just put the cork back in it and stick it in the refrigerator. Red wine in the refrigerator is not a foul. It's a total 
the right play. And you might get an extra three to four days. Out yeah. Of it. And in fact, really good red wine is going to be as good or better the next day and even the third day. Yeah. So people get too hung up about if I don't, if I don't finish it, what's going to happen. It's not going to go bad. It's going to take to, for it to become vinegar. It would take like months, literally. So, um, that's not an issue. So let's get into this red. In particular, red wine from Italy can handle three or four days of oxygen sometimes. Usually you want to drink a bottle of wine you have within 48 hours. If you're not going to finish it and you just had a glass, this bottle of wine you can see is three quarters full. If I put a cork in this and I put it in my refrigerator and I find it four days later, it's probably going to be about 85% as good as it was. So the refrigerator slows down the rate of oxidation. There's something called acetobacter, which actually is eating the alcohol, turning it into vinegar that's happening to every glass of wine you have. Um, and that's how you make salad dressing. That's how you make balsamic vinegar is you leave a, something that's been fermented out and it turns into vinegar. You wanna slow that down. That's why you add sulfur and a cork, but that's a tangent too, let's move on. Yeah, so I think this is gonna be a controversial wine uh, because this is a, a Northern Italian red. This is from an area, uh, the region is Piedmont. Uh, Piedmont's capital is Turin. You're not far from the uh, Swiss and eventually French Alps. The, um, the Olympics of Turin. Yeah, the Olympics of Turin a couple of years ago. Um, and I think Glenn has the picture. Right, that's Selena. That's Italy. Okay, I keep going. It's the one with the vine row, that one. All right, and you can see in the back, that's a great shot of the Alto Piemonte. So this is the northern part of Piedmont. You're roughly on a parallel with like Milan and some of the Great Lakes up there. You can know, we Lake see the Maggiore. map, uh, Glenn, the map, please? And you can see those... Alps, that's a year round view. You know, that's like, that's uh, uh, Monte Rosa is their best. So Piedmont, where the, where, the, where the sort of M in Piedmont is, is roughly where we are. So like almost parallel with Milan. Hey, Glenn, move your cursor to the left about three inches uh, mm -hmm. where Piedmont is, the M in Piedmont. Up, 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 left. Northwest, left, left. Right there. there. You go. <laughs> that's yeah, where we are. Yeah, that's where we are, right? Like kind of near where we go into the Valle d'Osta. And so this is like, sort of a subalpine climate. It's um, some people are probably familiar with the wines of Barolo and Barbaresco, which are also from Piedmont. Um, they're made from a grape called Nebbiolo. Well, this is sort of the northerly cousin to Nebbiolo from Barolo and Barbaresco. Nebbiolo is a very, uh, one, of, one of Italy's sort of signature grape varieties. It's the, uh, not only is it the grape in Barolo and Barbaresco, but it's, it's really considered like one of the world's great grape varieties. It is also for a lot of folks that might be used to a sort of a juicier, darker, more hedonistic wine experience. Like say Camus, for yeah, example. Yeah, like a Camus or like a, a big, a nice big duckhorn Merlot or something like that. This is a whole different animal. Nebbiolo is a grape that ripens very late. It's a grape that has pretty low natural color pigmentation, but is also a grape that's inclined towards pretty high alcohol. So even though it doesn't look like a full-bodied wine, it actually is a full-bodied wine. It's also a pretty tannic wine. Why don't we start? Why don't yeah, we go you know, through the so, so if you're if you're ever if you're ever wanting to see color, one thing I would advise: never look up towards the sky. You want to look down using the light above you, reflecting off of a white paper. And if you can actually see it and you tilt it away from yourself, especially if I was doing a blind tasting, say you handed me this glass of wine, if you kind of roll it back and forth, you'll see a heavy amount of garnet and almost oranging on the rim, which is a very typical thing of Nebbiolo. It's also very typical of Sangiovese, Tempranillo from Spain, as well as Merlot from the right bank of Bordeaux. So there's not many grapes that have orange on the meniscus at their youth. So all of a sudden, you know that there's pretty much four or five major grapes in the world that this could be. Um, you go ahead and swirl the glass. You know, these tiers are forming relatively quickly and coming down not super fast. I'm gonna guess this is 13 plus percent, maybe 13, 13 and a half, yep. um, just based on sight. Uh, and this wine is relatively delicate. If you go ahead and put your nose in the glass, this is, doesn't smell like a lot of fruit. Everyone smelled, you know, big like prisoner, right? Everyone's had prisoner. You've had Camus, you've had Duckhorn Merlot, you've had Silver Oak. Those are very intense fruit forward, lots of oak. This wine is more floral and it's more savory. It's more earthy. So the notes that are coming off, I'm getting almost like a spicy orange peel. There's like this tar, there's a uh, like a rose petal, almost a little bit of a, of a stem. Like you cut into the flower of the rose. You're getting a little bit of that green tone, this alpine herbaceous note, this turned earth, um, sour cherry, 
comes to mind. Anything else? Oh, that's a great, that, I mean, that's what he said. I think that that's um, really um, nails it. And that's the appeal. That's what people love about Nebbiolo is that it is a very perfumed style. It's a very perfumed aroma. Some, some wines have more of that, like for example, Sauvignon Blanc is very perfumey as well. This is, that's one of the things that draws people to the Nebbiolo grape. It's what one of the things that draws people to the Pinot Noir grape. They're not necessarily about mass. They're about this nuance and, and complexity of aroma that can be very entrancing. Um, that this is um, also, but it's, it's also wine texturally that yeah. is, is gonna be challenging for some. It's got a lot of acidity, it's got a lot of talent. This is and, polarizing. I think you said polarizing. This I is said a very, polarizing. This is a very polarizing wine. Let's go ahead and take a sip. And then I want you to try it with food afterwards. So let's take a sip on its own. I want everybody to chew this wine for like eight to 10 seconds. No joke. Watch me. Swallow it. You guys feel all the tannin, almost like burlap on the front and top of your gums, on the sides of your palate. That is typical Nebbiolo. It's, it's searing acidity, high acid, high tannin, generally high alcohol for Barolo but this is more high Alpine. This is at the foot of the Alps. You're, you know, 2000 feet higher in elevation than Barolo. And these are just these wines that really want fat. You want fat, you want slow braises, you want oxtail papardel. You want some beautiful, you know, uh, pork ragu over papardel with Parmigiano Reggiano, lots of fat to bind to the tannin. And also the acidity cuts through the fat. So having this wine on its own, it's kind of like listening to a flautist do a solo for 30 minutes. You're like ready for something else. But then you take some nuts, you know, take a bite of Parmesan cheese and let's try it again. Ian, how about this with, um, with pizza? A hundred percent. You know what? That's probably the, the, one of the best pairings you could ever have with most Italian wines is a simple pizza. It's such, this is such a perfect pizza as wine. As long as it's not like a lot of red pepper or anything because right. the heat of spice, spicy heat, like, you know, red chili flake and that kind of thing really will accentuate the alcohol and the tannin to a point where it can be unpleasant. That's why oftentimes this wine's a great foil for stuff that might otherwise be like, imagine, well, of course, Piedmont is truffle country. So this is where they hunt for white truffles. You know, if you've ever had them shave the truffles over your pasta, it's just like the kind of pastas that you eat in Piedmont are fresh pastas, usually not dried. They're dressed simply with butter and then they shave a whole bunch of earthy truffles over them. And then you can see this wine starting to make a lot more sense because you've got all this like smells of the earth and the woods, what the wine smells like, but then the wine's texture really kind of acts as a foil to that all that fat all that richness and the wine just phew, just scissors through it you know if you're going to have pizza don't you know save the ranch and the red pepper for, for, for the next time <laughs> no ranch <laughs> no ranch or red peppers just have a nice pizza what, does he like pizza but, with ranch no it's a it? joke no it's a joke oh, it's just a joke no glenn for for the record glenn ranch. doesn't eat ranch with his pizza okay it was just a bad <laughs> joke I'm, I'm full of bad jokes you guys have already seen that um Self-admitted, it's my my parents' fault. Let's um, let's jump into um, decoding the label here, if you'd like. Um, this is a it's got a lot going on here. Um, so Mazzoni, you can reasonably conclude that that's the name of the family that made it. Oftentimes, though, with European wines, the biggest name on the label is not the the producer name. It can often be the place. So you see here, Colline Novaresi. The hills around Novara. Novara is kind of the key oh. town up there. And you can see right under that appellation, and sort of by law, this is required on labels. If it's an appellation, it will say so right under that, and that's smaller tonight. Type Denominazione di origine controllata. That means denomination of controlled origin. So that's actually a step up in terms of rigidity from typical geographic indication. So this is not just a place name, Colline Novarese. So it's, that means that it comes from the hills around Novara in Northern Piedmont, but it's also a whole production formula for the wine that the producer needs to follow. So that might include how long it can be aged, what grape varieties they can use, all those kinds of things. So there's a, there's a whole set of prescriptions that goes around getting a denomination of controlled origin. You see up here on the neck, they have a little kind of band that guarantees that, it, that it's met those criteria. 
In this case, they've given you also the grape name, Nebbiolo del Monteregio. Um, and then you have a little bit more about who the producer is and where they are in that little province. If you know your Italian provinces, you know that's the province of Novara, N-O, um, produced in Italy, volume, and then a little, uh, this is Vigneron, uh, Vignaioli Independenti is like sort of naturally uh, oriented winemakers uh, association. And then on the back, pretty much a repeat of uh, what, it, what you saw on the front, just a little more uh, utilitarian. And then you see their importer. Now that's something that if you, if you dig it, if you dig European wine and you want to start exploring, there's a few importers that are incredibly like the back label also, you know, the, oh, this is part of their thing. Like, for example, there's a guy named Terry Thies who specializes in German wines. If you're into German wines, you flip the bottle around, you see Terry Thies's name on it. Uh, you're probably going to get a good one. You flip the bottle around, you see Kermit Lynch on a bottle of French wine. This guy's like the, the father of French wine importation in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that company, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said about who actually brought this thing here? Who selected it in the first place and, and made the arrangements to get it to the United States for us to drink? So that's something that maybe as you get more into wine, you'll start sw swinging those bottles around and finding some favorites among the importers. North Berkeley is a favorite of ours for sure. They do some great stuff. Without question. You know, and I would, I would you know, we, ha we have some time left for questions, but I would say that this wine is so different on its own. Some of you might love it. Some some of you might not like it. So if you like, if you're used to drinking a Napa Cab all the time, for example, this wine is such a polar opposite. Um, I would invite you to have like a simple, you know, pasta sauce and put some ground beef in there. Have it with some, you know, fresh parsley and, and a lot of Parmigiano Reggiano, and retry something like this. It's going to completely change your experience because of the fat and the the pasta and everything coming together. Um, these both are truly food and wines. If you if you went to Babo in New York, or if you went to a, a top Italian restaurant and you had this with the right Hamachi Crudo, for example, with well, you know some sort of uh, you know special uh, you know or octopus, herbs on top octopus, or a lot octopus, a yeah. lot of lemon, you know these wines really start to make sense. On their own, they're so different than what you might normally have if you like oaky buttery Chardonnays from California. This is, it's don't, striking such a different chord. Don't I'm type saying, cast. don't typecast. I'm just saying. My, it's the my, land my, of Friday Night Lights. That doesn't only mean they're all is, drinking the buttery Chardonnay. My only point is these are the most popular wines in America. Right. That's the only reason right. I'm saying right. them. Right. They're the most popular wines. That's a fact. And these are such a different flavor experience that it takes time to really kind of get into the What to he's the trying changes. to say is get off the cougar juice and onto some wine with a little bit of uh, acidity, that's what you a little said. bit of snap. That's what you said. A little bit of snap. Get off the <laughs> cougar juice and try something with a little bit of bite. Um, live a little. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, why store wine in a dark environment? Uh, Ken is wondering. Uh, it's susceptible. Like there's, what's the term for light susceptibility? Like light, light can break down uh, light, light, excessive UV penetration. There's a term for it and I can't think of it right now. Um, so basically light, light breaks things down. If you have a bottle that's sitting in light, even in the front window of a liquor store, that wine will become brown in 12 months to 18 months. Light is incredibly strong. Look at what happens, uh, you know, when you spend a lot of time in the sun, right? It breaks down your skin. It's, it's it, the same thing happens with um, Cristal, for example, they have that, that gold paper. If everyone's ever bought a bottle of Cristal, they have that really gold paper that protects light from breaking down the, the molecular structure. And if you break down the molecular structure, you're affecting the aromatic compounds, which bring you pleasure by taste and smell. So that's why you want wines that have been stored in darkness. I mean, I've, I've had wines presented to me in a blind tasting one time. I was in Paris, I was in, Paris in 2007, and I was blind tasted on a wine. I thought it was 1992 Burgundy. It was actually 1929. The wine had been aged in a pile of wine underneath the city of Bone for 70 plus years and had never seen the light of day because the day it was made, it was put into a pile with a bunch of bottles over it. And then there was a bunch of mold that grew on the bottles. So the wine had never seen light. So the wine, when you looked at it, looked 20 years old and they pulled the bottle out. It was in 1929. And I, and I was like, it was one of the greatest wines I've ever tasted. But when you start to appreciate wine without seeing the label, it's very strange when you're, you know, when you're, when you're 60 years off the final conclusion. And that's really comes from how a wine was stored. Um, so, you know, I'm looking it up. I can't find it. There's a term for it. Trust me. But light damage is real. That's all I'm going to say. Light damage is real. Light yeah, protect, damage is real. You know, and if, and if you're, and if you're letting a wine sit um, in a sunny room in your house for two months, it's probably not going to be a big deal. 
if it's for two or three years, it's going to start to affect it. And after five to six, it's really going to 